algebraic surfaces and hyperbolic geometry. Um, and uh, yeah, they, this is not particularly related to my uh, second talk this afternoon. Um, although they both are vaguely about uh, minimal model theory. Um, OK, well, uh, Fujino described the uh, cone theorem at the end. Uh, let me just uh, describe it more slowly to, uh, to get started. Um, so let's see. Uh, let x be uh, a, um, let's say, smooth projective variety to get started. Um, later, I'll uh, allow some mild singularities. Um, and uh, there's, I just described it, <laughs> basic cones uh, attached to this by, by Mori and others. Um, so they live in some vector spaces. Um, but, uh, and one of x be, um, let's say, the real vector space of, um, spanned by divisors by co-dimension one sub varieties of x um, and modulo for me uh, numerical equivalence, um, which means I'll just write this again that um, uh, two divisors with real coefficients are uh, linearly are numerically equivalent by definition if and only if um, they have the same intersection number with all curves. So. Um, and yeah, for a singular, well, um, okay, there's that and there's, uh, let's say the dual vector space um, and sub one of x, one, one dimensional cycles. Um, so you could say it's just the dual of, of that space or you could say that it's um, consists of one cycles. That is it's um, a vector space spanned by curves by irreducible um, one-dimensional sub-varieties of x, again, modulo um, numerical equivalence in the same sense. So two one-cycles are numerically equivalent if they have the same pairing with all uh, co-dimension one sub-varieties. Um, OK, and inside these things, you have obvious convex cones. Um, so you've got, uh, so definition, the cone of curves, which was called uh, any bar of x in Fujino's talk. Um, just means the closed convex cone in this vector space of one cycles spanned by actual curves, um, by actual one-dimensional sub irreducible sub varieties. Um, so you take, instead of all real linear combinations of curves, you take positive linear combinations and take the closure, and that gives you some closed convex cone in this vector space. So of course, I should say these things are um, finite dimensional. Um, because uh, the dimension is called the, the card number um, of x. And um, over the complex numbers, one way to know that they're finite dimensional is that this is a subspace of h upper 2. And um, it's the subspace spanned by co-dimension 1 algebraic subvarieties. And this is the subspace of the second homology subspace spanned by algebraic curves. Um, OK, so inside, this, inside the homology, if you want, there's positive linear combinations of algebraic curves. That's some cone. Um, and there's the dual cone of that in an in, uh, upper one. I guess I should take less space. Um, so the, um, the net cone um, is, is uh, say, the dual cone of um, two uh, cone of curves. Um, this lives in the dual vector space, which the definition of the dual cone in convex geometry is a set of um, classes of uh, R divisors um, that have non-negative pairing with all curves. So, 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 I mean, in convex geometry, the definition of the dual cone would be elements of the dual vector space that have non-negative pairing with every element of this cone, but obviously, Having non-negative pairing with every element of that cone is the same as having non-negative degree on all curves. OK. Uh, right. OK, and these things, I mean, it's sort of a basic reason why these things are 
these cones are interesting in algebraic geometry is that this describes which line bundles are ample. So uh, Kleiman's theorem says um, that uh, a line bundle uh, L on a projective variety X is ample if and only if um, its, uh, its class lies in the interior of this uh, Neff cone. Um, its class in this real vector space lies in the interior of the Neff cone. <coughs> so that says that, um, yeah, I mean, of course, I guess uh, I'm allowed to use algebraic geometry at the basic level, but a line bundle gives me a, an element of this vector space. Uh, take uh, the divisor, take a given inline bundle, take a rational section that has some divisor of zeros and poles, and that lives in this vector space. Um, Okay, yeah, so that says that an apple line bundle, for one thing, it's got to have positive degree on every curve, but I um, mean, this, this condition is slightly stronger uh, than that. Um, yeah, okay. So, yeah, what else can I say? Um, yeah, so there's some, maybe if, if the cone of curves is really little, like this, then that implies that the, the net cone, the dual cone, will be really big, like this, and um, this is in the vector space of one cycles, this is in the dual vector space of um, co-dimension one cycles, and, and the line bundle is ample if, um, if its class lies in the, in the interior of this uh, dual cone. So it's got to have positive pairing with all curves, but also on all um, limits of curves, uh, class, you know, points there. Whatever they may mean geometrically, L has to have positive pairing with them. Okay. Um, that's why, that's the basic reason why we care about these curves. I'll state the, um, care about these cones. Oh, of course, and, uh, I mean, ample line bundles we care about because that's how you <coughs> embed varieties in projective space. If you want to classify abstract varieties, you know, you've got to embed them in projective space. Um, and so you've got to know which line bundles are, are ample. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, state the cone theorem again by, uh, Uh, say, Mori, Kalamata, Shakurov, um, uh, well, let's write a few more, uh, Reed, Kolar, Regina. Um, so, um, let's see, so the, uh, what, I guess I just need no further assumption. I have, for example, a smooth projective variety, and then I can say that um, sort of half of the cone of curves is, is well understood. Um, cone of curves intersects the um, the K negative half space. Um, I'll describe this in a second. Uh, how do I want to say this? I guess my favorite formulation is to say that this is something about extremal rays of that cone. So every um, extremal ray of the closed cone of curves, it's uh, inside the K negative half space, um, is isolated among the set of extremal rays. It's, it's rational, so it's spanned by um, a rational linear combination of curves, not just by some real linear combination. It's actually spanned by a single rational curve. Um, and, which is stronger than being rational, uh, and uh, every extreme ray, and it can be uh, contracted. So there's a, as Fugino wrote down, there's some uh, mapping from X onto some other projective variety that contracts to a point exactly those curves whose class lies in any given uh, ray. So I can pick any, either any extreme array of this cone and, um, sorry, if it's in this k-negative half space, then I can make a map from x to some other projective variety that squashes this curve to a point. Uh, right, so this thing means the set of uh, elements, what are these things going to be called, uh, say, u in the space of one cycles, um, such that the canonical bundle of the whole variety has negative pairing with, with that. Uh, right, so, so the picture everybody draws is that um, in, inside this vector space of one cycles, um, there's the classes on which the canonical bundle has positive degree and the classes on which it has negative degree, have I mean, or positive degree, and there's this uh, hyperplane 
classes that have zero pairing with a canonical bundle of X. And, um, you know, here's the origin. And over on this side, the, the, this cone looks rather polyhedral. Um, although you might have infinitely many uh, extremal rays, at least they don't have any limits except on this uh, hyperplane. Something like this. And over here you might have uh, something, some round cone or otherwise some uh, convex cone that we don't know very much about. Okay. But on this side, these extremal rays are isolated and, uh, and each one is spanned by some single algebraic curve. <coughs> okay. Um, right. Yeah. And that's sort of the uh, founding fact of the whole minimal, minimal model program. Once you know that you can do those contractions, then you can start simplifying any algebraic variety you like um, by, by getting rid of those k-negative curves by contracting them. Okay. Oh, right. And so here I said this. At the beginning, maybe I said that x was a uh, smooth projective variety, but I should make the point that, um, so more generally, if, um, if x is not necessarily smooth, but x uh, comes with some divisor that makes it uh, a lot canonical pair, then um, you get exactly, as Fujina said, you get exactly the same conclusion where um, for sort of for a different half space than this uh, cone of curves. And same holds um, for the closed cone of curves intersects um, kx plus b negative. Okay. So, um, so for example, if x is smooth, then this is this generalization is already useful because you know you have this freedom. You can choose lots of different uh, divisors for which this is a log canonical pair, and therefore you get, um, in, in general, you might get lots of different half spaces. Say something like this. This might be k x plus b negative part. You might get lots of different half spaces on which, on which you know that the cone of curves is is nice and polyhedral. So obviously, the more such divisors you can find, the, the better better for you. Okay, <coughs> so let's see. Um, let's go to next, all right. Okay, so, yeah, so uh, special case of that is that um, so if x is mono, which means that the anti-canonical bundle, maybe I'll divide this. Uh, if the anti-canonical bundle is ample. Um, then, uh, then this picture applies to the whole cone of curves because this uh, assumption means exactly that minus k has positive intersection with uh, every curve or, or a limit of curves. So this would be something like kx negative in this case. Um, <coughs> so if you're in this situation, then you know that applies to every extreme array because they're all isolated in the they form a compact topological space. There's just finally many extremal rays. Um, and so that says that uh, the cone of curves is just uh, a rational polyhedral cone. Um, is a rational polyhedral cone, which means the um, convex cone spanned by finally many rational points. Um, in this uh, vector space of one cycles. Yeah. So the way I define this, this is a, a real vector space, but obviously it has a rational structure represented by um, just rational linear combinations of curves instead of real linear combinations. Right. Um, and therefore, it's a trivial consequence that the, the dual cone, the next cone, is also a rational polyhedral for x final. Um, okay, and yeah, so then this thing is really is a polyhedral cone, and um, maybe you draw a slightly more complicated picture, something like this, you know. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, and again, you can make the point that the, the, the same thing, uh, you know, this, 
if you know that x is a uh, log Fano, in the sense that you can find some divisor such that uh, kx plus b is negative, then, um, then you're going to get exactly the same conclusion. Um, so just write that out to be emphatic. So more generally, if, <coughs> if there is some um, R divisor, oh, I guess, I, I, yeah, this may to be, just, just to be clear here, B needs to be effective. Um, so the notion of log canonical would, would make sense even if B had negative coefficients. But, but for this cone theorem, you definitely want that to be effective. Um, right, so more generally, if there's an effective uh, divisor, R divisor B with um, XB uh, log canonical Fano pair, um, which means that this is a log canonical pair and uh, the negative of Kx plus B is ample instead of the negative of Kx being ample, um, then you get, you get the same conclusion. Then again, the cone of curves and it's dual of an F cone are a rational polyhedral. Okay. Yeah. And this is a non trivial, say going from here to here is a non trivial, from here to here is a non trivial generalization. There are lots of varieties that are not Fano, say smooth projective varieties, but where you can find some divisor that makes them uh, into a, a, a Fano pair. I guess you give some quick example. So um, if you take uh, P2 blown up at um, any number of points um, on a, that lie on a smooth conic um, in P2, smooth curve of degree 2, um, then, uh, then there is always some, you can always write down some divisor that makes it uh, even a KLT final pair. So then there's this a divisor. Uh, Q divisor B such that um, X comma V is a KLT uh, pair. Um, whereas um, this thing is definitely not Fano if N is big enough. Um, it's not a Del Pezzo surface. Um, certainly if N is at least uh, nine or even a bit smaller than that, I guess. Um, so that's right. Anyway, so the point is that there's there's tons of uh, examples of uh, there, there's sort of a, a fair number of examples of Fano varieties. There are a lot more examples of, of Fano pairs, and so you know this is a useful way if you want to control these uh, cones for some class of varieties. Yep. That's right. That's the great thing about this. It's that's that's good news. You know. I mean, yeah. So if you can find some B that, that makes this true, then you're happy. Then, then you know these good properties of X. Yeah. But the argument when you have no B is that the, 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 the Fano pair is positive. Yeah, yeah. So this, this being ample means that, right. Yeah. yeah. So I'll just say it. I mean, this, this assumption is really telling you that K, this K plus B is uh, it's negative on the whole closed cone of curves, I mean, minus the origin. And, and so that picture applies. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So there's that. Okay. So now I guess <coughs> the uh, so this was sort of this uh, good news that there's lots of uh, surfaces, lots of varieties where you can prove that these um, cones are rational polyhedral. Um, and then there's this bad news that for lots of other varieties, these cones are not rational polyhedral. Um, so here are some more examples. These are mostly very uh, standard examples. Um, so that XB P2 blown up at n uh, very general points. So yeah. when you uh, when you take a bunch of points uh, in, in P2 and and, and blow them up, then, then the properties of the surface you get depend a lot on the, how these points are arranged. Um, so, yeah, I blow up. Here I was blowing up n points, a, a number of points uh, in rather special position. Now I, now I consider what happens 
for a bunch of points in general position, and it's, it's different. Um, <coughs> so let's see, what can I say about, say, the, the nef cone of x or something? Um, well, let's see. So if n is the most 8, then everybody knows that x is Fano. This is the standard construction of del Pezzo surfaces. Um, and, uh, you know, and so by, these, so by the cone theorem, say, um, the cone of curves um, is rational polyhedral. Um, yeah. And in this case, we know infinitely more about it. Uh, namely, so in fact, um, so I guess for, uh, say, n between 2 and 8, um, the <coughs> It's, it's, uh, the extremal rays of this cone are exactly spanned by the minus 1 curves on x. So, <clears throat> so, the, um, so in particular, there are only finally many minus 1 curves on x. Um, so whatever. So. <laughs> Sorry that I don't uh, have too many pictures of uh, rational polyhedral cones at hand. Um, but anyway, so there's the minus 1 curves on x. Um, I mean, of course, when you blow up a point, uh, it turns into a minus 1 curve, I should say. A minus 1 curve means um, yeah, a curve that's isomorphic to P1 and has on a surface and has self-intersection minus 1. Um, so I mean, when you, when you define a surface by blowing up points on P2, you have these obvious minus 1 curves uh, lying over these points, but then you have various other minus 1 curves. Um, for example, the line through any two points has self-intersection 1 on P2, but when you blow up, the self-intersection goes down by 2, so it becomes a minus 1 curve, and there are various other minus 1 curves. But anyway, in this situation, there's, uh, and in most of it, you get only finally many minus 1 curves, and they span this cone of curves. And, uh, you know, of course, there's much more that you can say that the set of minus 1 curves is completely described in terms of some root system corresponding to the number n, where, say, n equals 8 corresponds to the E8 root system. And there's, in that case, 240 um, minus 1 curves corresponding to the 240 roots in the E8 root system. So that's a great uh, story, but then n and at least 9 is kind of the bad news. Um, and um, so if so again I consider P2 blown up at n uh, very general points and if n is at least 9 then certainly x is not Fano just because um, you can compute the self-intersection number of minus k and it's 9 minus it's 9 for P2 and then you blow up the point it goes down by 1 so um, so there's no way minus k could be ample when n is at least 9. This would have to be positive. Um, but even worse than that, I mean, you might think, is it Fano type? Is it uh, log Fano for some choice of b or something? But no, it's, it's worse than that because um, and x has, contains infinitely many minus 1 curves. Um, for example, by um, Nagata, although Definitely older algebraic geometers knew this. Anyway, there's a proof that we can understand by a Nagata, which is actually given an exercise in Hartshorn chapter 5. Uh, it's a nice exercise. So, so they're using Cremona transformations starting from um, the obvious minus 1 curves. You produce more and more, um, eventually produce infinitely many minus 1 curves. Somehow when n is least 9, this works. When if n is smaller, yeah. Anyway, that's what happens. Um, and, you know, so the cone of curves um, is not rational polyhedral because um, I should have said that for any curve with negative self-intersection on a surface, that's always an isolated extremal array of the cone of curves. So here you've got infinitely many um, isolated extremal arrays. It's not rational polyhedral in my sense. Uh, and um, equivalently, um, the nef cone is not rational polyhedral. 
Um, what else can I say? Oh yeah, okay, and this is, um, yeah, so this, this sort of shows the, what's happening in the cone theorem a bit because, um, so note that um, a, a minus one curve on a surface um, uh, always has, uh, the degree of the canonical bundle on that is always minus one, um, which means that these mi minus one curves on any surface are always lying on sort of the good side of the cone of curves, the k-negative side. Um, so here's zero, and um, for, for this uh, surface, P2 blown up at nine or more general points, you've got infinitely many um, minus one curves. You know, even on this good side of the cone of curves, there's this sort of infiniteness happening. Um, those rays have to be approaching this, this hyperplane, kx perp. But uh, sorry, this is a picture of the cone of curves. Um, Um, right. So even, even on this good side, there's a certain amount of infiniteness which is allowed by the cone theorem. And it can actually happen in, in this example. Um, this is sort of a, the point I wanted to add was that <coughs> you could ask what is the uh, k-positive side of the cone of curves look like in this case. And the frustrating fact is that it's, it's not known. Um, it's uh, conjectured to be something like a, a round cone, but um, that's not known. So I'll just write that down. So um, let's see. Let me just make the point that for any surface, uh, any projective surface, um, the closed cone of curves is always um, the closed convex cone spanned by um, spanned by the positive cone together with the uh, curves of negative self-intersection. Um, Right, so the positive cone means a set of classes of one cycles that have, um, say, non-negative self-intersection and have um, non-negative pairing with some ample line bundle, H. It doesn't matter which ample line bundle you take. Um, so you'll have this, this sort of picture that uh, the classes in N1 of X with, with uh, positive self-intersection are the ones that are in, inside this cone or inside this cone, and, and the second condition just picks out um, one of those two pieces. This is the positive cone. And, uh, sorry, uh, what I was gonna say is the close cone occurs is always the close convex cone spanned by that, together with um, the curves of negative self-intersection on X, whatever they may be. So why is this true? It's, it's, it's obvious uh, because obviously any curve has either, uh, either positive or, or zero self-intersection or it maybe has negative self-intersection that sticks out somewhere. Um, conversely, why is anything in the positive cone in the closed cone of curves? Well, it's just by Riemann rock, if you have a point in there, then um, some high multiple of that is represented by an effective sum of curves by, uh, by Riemann rock. Okay, so this is an easy fact. Um, right. <coughs> oh yeah, so I wanted to describe what the conjecture is for this cone of curves of this surface. Um, so conjecturally, um, uh, in this example, all minus one, oh sorry, all curves uh, with negative self-intersection on, on this very general blow up are just the minus one curves. Um, which we know somewhat explicitly, although I didn't really say that. Um, but anyway, this is uh, not known. It's uh, related to what's called Nagata's conjecture or the, or the Harper and Hershevitz uh, conjecture. Anyway, so that would say that's, that, the, that this cone is uh, sort of the convex hull of these sort of uh, minus one curves which are arranged in some sort of discrete way together with this round uh, cone. But, okay, we don't know. Uh, so on, on this surface, P2 blown up at nine or more general points, um, all curves with negative self-intersection on X are minus one curves, meaning that they're isomorphic to P1 and they have self-intersection minus one. So there's no other curves with negative self-intersection. So other curves with self negative self-intersection might a priori be sticking out here somewhere. Um, 
but we hope that they don't exist. I mean, for sort of special arrangements of points, there, there will be curves that stick out here, but we hope that for very general arrangements of points, um, there are no other negative curves. Okay. Um, so that's sort of one example of <coughs> definitely non-rational polyhedral behavior of these cones. Um, there's another standard example, which is um, let x be an abelian surface. So a two-dimensional abelian variety. Um, then, then it's easy to describe the cone of curves. Uh, it's just equal to a positive cone. Um, so like so, uh, this round cone that I drew. Um, be because, I mean, how do, you, how do you prove that? It's equivalent to say that um, uh, there are no curves with negative self-intersection on an abelian surface. Um, uh, right, and you prove that just by using translations on an abelian surface. So, uh, can't really draw it in the correct dimension, but I mean, if you have some curve on an abelian surface, um, then C is numerically equivalent to, uh, you know, some other curve, whatever that might be. Um, some translate of this curve C prime. And um, so the self-intersection number of C is the intersection number of C with this different curve, which is automatically non-negative. You can only have, yeah. I mean, the intersection of two different curves on a surface is always non-negative. Um, and so, yeah, we're using the fact that a million variety has enough symmetries to move curves around. <coughs> okay, but anyway, so the point is that this curve, uh, it's, you know, bad from the point, it's a nice cone in some ways, but it's, that from the point of view of the cone theorem, and that it's not rational polyhedral, at least um, if the Picard number is big enough. Um, so if an abelian surface has um, Picard number uh, row at least three, and then, then if, this, if you have this cone in a three-dimensional vector space, then it's definitely not rational polyhedral. Um, I mean, you could look at this cone in a two-dimensional vector space, or, uh, and it, then it might or might not be rational polyhedral. Um, so x is an abelian surface with the card number two. Um, then the cone of curves, we sort of know explicitly what it is. Um, it, you know, it's, it's a set of divisor classes with positive self-intersection, or one of the two pieces of that. Um, and that might or might not be a rational polyhedral cone. So there's uh, examples both ways. Anyway, uh, let me just add that, uh, you know, that rho is somewhere between 1 and 4 for, um, for a complex abelian surface. And uh, for a sort of general abelian surface, the Picard number is going to be 1, but there are lots of, there are special abelian surfaces where the Picard number, you know, is, is 4 or 3 or whatever. So in short, there are lots of examples um, of abelian surfaces where the cone of curves is not rational polyhedral. <coughs> okay. Okay, and sort of one last uh, example sort of briefly described is that if you take x to be a K3 surface, then this is sort of similar to what happens for abelian surfaces, only uh, even more complicated. So, uh, so the only curves um, with negative self-intersection on a K3 surface are um, minus 2 curves. This is easy uh, to check, um, meaning curves that are isomorphic, they're smooth curves, they're isomorphic to P1, and they have self-intersection minus 2. Um, okay, so yeah, so in that sense, we know what the cone of curves looks like in a, in a vague sense. It's spanned by the positive cone together with the classes of minus two curves. Um, and, well, are there any minus two curves? The answer is there might or might not be. Um, so we can have, for different K3 surfaces, we can have either <coughs> um, no minus two curves, and then, so the cone of curves is equal to uh, this round cone, um, the positive cone that I drew 
as happens for abelian surfaces, or you might have finally many um, minus two curves. And in that case, uh, then the clinical curves is, is just, it, as it happens, it's spanned by those minus two curves. Um, so it's rational polyhedral. Um, this is maybe like Kovach. Uh, um, and also it might happen that you might have infinitely many minus two curves. Um, and then, um, then certainly this clinical curves is not rational polyhedral because it's got these infinitely many uh, extremal arrays, isolated extremal arrays. Okay, so so you have this sort of variety of uh, uh, more or less bad things that that can happen, and it's kind of hard to think of any sort of unifying description of what's going on in this example. Okay, much less for uh, varieties in general. In other words, there just doesn't seem to be much uh, control you can have over the conal curves um, apart from what the cone theorem uh, tells you. So you have this bit of flexibility in the cone theorem that you can stick in different divisors. Um, but uh, nonetheless, there, there can be this complexity if you want to understand the whole cone. <coughs> okay, but I, I want to, the point of today's talk is that there is something good and unifying you can say about um, the cone, at least for Calabi-Yau varieties, at least uh, conjecturally. And you can prove everything you want in dimension two. So there's this result by Stirk, uh, Lianga, and Namikawa. Um, that I would say it's, uh, it's, a, it's a good, it's an ideal substitute for the cone theorem um, that, that tells you about the whole cone of curves for a Calabi-Yau surface. So, uh, yeah, so let x be um, a Calabi-Yau surface, and by, for the moment what I mean by that is that x is a smooth projective surface uh, and the canonical bundle is numerically trivial, so a Billion surface or a K3 surface or a quotient of one of those things by a finite group acting freely. Uh, so then, um, what can I say? So then, you're right, the point is that the, uh, the Neff cone need not be rational polyhedral, as we've seen in these examples there and there, but um, it is sort of rational polyhedral modular automorphisms of a, of a variety. Um, so let's see. The group of automorphisms of the variety acts on all these vector spaces of. <coughs> divisors that I described, it obviously preserves these, the cone of uh, Neff divisors, and it, I claim that it acts on that cone with a um, rational polyhedral fundamental domain. So I'll sort of expand on what this means. Um, yeah, so I mean, just to draw a quick picture, that means that the uh, Neff cone might, as happens for billion surfaces, it might be some sort of round cone like this, but if that happens, then the theorem is telling you that the automorphism group of X um, has to be infinite and it has to sort of be big enough to divide this cone into uh, pieces that are, that are rational polyhedral cones. So automorphism group of X is, is act, it's preserving this cone and it has to break it up into pieces that are rational polyhedral. So uh, I don't know if I want to write down the definition of this. It means that you know, there is some, one way to say it is there is some rational polyhedral cone <laughs> inside the Neff cone such that uh, uh, the whole Neff cone, maybe not worrying about its boundary for a second, is the union of, of translates of one rational polyhedral cone. And these different translates, uh, either two translates are equal to each other or they don't meet except possibly in their boundaries. So these, yeah, cones don't uh, overlap except in the nice way that they might meet on their boundaries. Um, yeah. Okay. So let me give, maybe give some example where uh, you can see why this is true. So, for example, take X to be an abelian surface. <coughs> um, then, then uh, it's not so hard to analyze the automorphism group of an abelian surface. Oh, maybe I should just uh, make one preliminary point. Okay. So. Um, let me just make a definition here. Um, define uh, ought star of x to be um, 
just the image of the automorphism group acting on um, divisors mod numerical equivalence. So uh, obviously an automorphism preserves this real vector space of divisors and um, you could look at the image of that group homomorphism. Um, so this is obviously a, a countable group because it preserves some integral lattice in there. And um, this is essentially, this is um, up to finite index, the uh, discrete part of the automorphism group of x. Um, I'll put approximately equal to free equal up if two infinite groups are equal, uh, sort of up to finite index. Um, okay. Uh, right. So, I mean, this equality is easy. Uh, I mean, I, uh, the connected part of the automorphism group obviously acts trivially on this. <coughs> there's some finally generated abelian group in there. So, so, you know, this part of the automorphism group definitely acts trivially on, on there. And conversely, if you have an automorphism that acts as the identity on divisors of my numerical equivalence, then it's going to fix on ample uh, divisor. And so uh, the group of automorphisms that fixes an ample divisor is a linear algebraic group. So it has only finally many connected components. So anyway, so basically looking at this group is a way of talking, looking at the discrete part of the automorphism group of X. And I claim that's all that's really involved in this statement. So I could have written up star of X. Um, the, the connected part of the automorphism group just acts trivially on these codes. Okay, so yeah, so somehow this, this is the interesting part of the automorphism group for this statement, and I can now get onto this example of abelian surfaces. Um, okay. So, you know, why is this theorem true in that case? Well, the reason is that you can analyze the automorphism group of an abelian surface, and, um, I mean, as a surface, an uh, abelian surface has some connected automorphism group, the, you know, just translations, but I don't care about that. The discrete part of the automorphism group is up to finite index, just the orthogonal group of the Picard lattice. Um, is that what I want to call it? I mean, yeah, <coughs> pick module or pick not. So the thing is, this is uh, some finally generated abelian group um, with a bilinear form, the intersection form. Um, Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So what I'm saying is that for an abelian surface, the automorphism, the discrete part of the automorphism group is as big as it could possibly could be. It's uh, it's all automorphisms of this abelian group that preserve the intersection form, which obviously automorphisms uh, would have to do. O, o means just you know, it preserves a automorphisms of that abelian group that preserve the bilinear form. Okay. And <coughs> from that point of view, this, yeah, so for in the case of abelian surfaces, this is just some classical uh, uh, number theory, I guess you could say. So, so then, let's see, how should I put this? Uh, so by, there's different ways to talk about what's going on here. Let me just, uh, I'm trying to explain why this implies that, why the theorem is true for building surfaces. Maybe it's helpful to make the following point, that um, for any smooth projective surface, um, the, uh, the intersection form on divisors always has a certain uh, signature by the Hodge index theorem. Um, so, one comma rho minus one by Hodge index theorem this means there's, uh, there's one positive direction and the rest are negative. That, that's why I could draw the set of classes with positive intersection um, this way. So yeah. That's why the positive cone uh, breaks up into two pieces like that. Um, okay, and right, so what does that tell me? Okay, and the thing is that say over the real numbers, the automorphism group of this sort of bilinear form <coughs> as a na natural geometric interpretation, it's the group of isometries of hyperbolic space. Okay, note that the identity component of this orthogonal group over the real numbers is exactly the isometries of, um, of real hyperbolic space of, of that uh, dimension.
Mm. Yeah, and this, this sort of comes up in some natural geometric way because inside the positive cone, you could look at the set of points with self-intersection one. Um, you know, you have a on this real vector space, you have a bilinear form of, of that signature, so some kind of Lorentzian metric. And if you restrict it to this a hypersurface, it's like restricting the Euclidean metric to the sphere. You get a metric of pos of constant curvature. In this case constant negative curvature. So sort of that is, um, that is hyperbolic space. The standard way to, this is the standard way to construct um, hyperbolic space. <laughs> okay. So why is that a point worth making? So that tells you that the automorphism group of any algebraic surface, um, if you look at the way it acts on divisors, it preserves this intersection form, which is to say that it acts by asymmetries on hyperbolic space. So, um, yeah, so for any projective surface, um, the uh, discrete part of the automorphism group is a discrete group of isometries of hyperbolic space. Um, real hyperbolic space. Um, so, you know, that the reason that's not always a very interesting observation is that for most algebraic surfaces, the automorphism group is almost nothing. Um, but for Calabi-Yau surfaces, it's, it's a very interesting group. Um, yeah, okay, so I can finish quickly talking about abelian surfaces. Okay. <coughs> okay. Um, so moreover, um, the orthogonal group of a, if I have any uh, lattice with this signature, any finally generated abelian group with a bilinear form with this signature, um, the orthogonal group of, of such a lattice always acts on um, real hyperbolic space. This is um, Z rho. Um, that always acts on hyperbolic space of dimension rho minus 1 with a rational polyhedral fundamental domain. Um, this is just um, a basic fact of number theory, maybe by Minkowski. Okay. What? The, yeah, I mean the discrete part of this. Right, right, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So, yeah, so this is this uh, picture that everybody knows. I mean, if you, um, you know, how can I say? If you have, for example, uh, two-dimensional hyperbolic space, then the group of uh, isometries of that sort of has a uh, rational polyhedral fundamental domain. I won't uh, draw this too well, but it, it breaks up the whole space into um, pieces which are rational polyhedral cones, uh, rational polyhedral um, Rational polyhedra, I guess they'd be called. So, so rational has a meaning because I'm thinking of hyperbolic space as being uh, this, this positive cone modulo scalars, and I can say a point in hyperbolic space is rational if, it if it's the image of some rational uh, ray here. Um, yeah, and, and let me just make the point that, you know, rational polyhedral cones in this picture, inside the positive cone, they correspond to geodesic polytopes in, in hyperbolic space. So this, this looks like it's, its sides are not straight, but I mean, this is a geodesic in hyperbolic space and it corresponds to a, you know, a linear hyperplane uh, in this picture. So, um, so this implies Stokes' theorem um, for abelian surfaces. <coughs> you know, we know what the automorphism group of um, an abelian surface is and it's as big as possible in the way it acts on hyperbolic space. It breaks up the whole hyperbolic space into pieces uh, which are rational polyhedra. Maybe I should also make the point that um, so any uh, polyhedron with finitely many sides in hyperbolic space um, has finite volume, um, even if some of its vertices are at infinity, as in that picture. Um, so
infinity in hyperbolic space means these points uh, on the on the boundary of this uh, ball if you draw hyperbolic space that way um, so yeah so this is a basic fact in hyperbolic geometry and that sort of gives you another way to think about what this <coughs> theorem is saying uh, let me rephrase this a bit uh, we can think of for any uh, smooth projective surface we can think of um, the net cone modular scalars as being a uh, convex subset of hyperbolic space, um, hyperbolic space of dimension rho minus one, just because it's it's some convex cone inside the positive cone, and uh, yeah, so Stirk's theorem, Stirk et al's theorem, says, or it implies that if X is a Claudia surface, um, then uh, the automorphism group acts on this convex set with a finite co-volume. So the whole set, the convex set might have infinite volume, but the automorphism group um, breaks it up into pieces with finite volume. Okay, which is to say that it's saying that the automorphism group is as big as it possibly could be. Um, because it's, it's contained in this discrete group, it couldn't sort of uh, break up uh, this cone into pieces with, with volume tending to zero or anything like that. Um, this, is, this is the biggest the automorphism group could be, and so Stirk's theorem is saying the automorphism group of a cloudy out surface is as big as it could conceivably be. Okay. So, yeah. <coughs> okay. Okay, so what can I say? Um, I should say a word about the proof for K3 surfaces. I mean, basically, uh, proof of Stokes theorem for K3 surfaces. Um, for Rebellion surfaces, I basically just gave the proof. Um, so I, since time is running out, I would just say that you use the um, Torelli theorem, the strong Torelli theorem, for K3s, um, which by uh, uh, Piotrowski, Shapiro, and uh, Shapirovich, um, because that gives you a way to um, produce isomorphisms between different abelian surfaces, abelian different uh, K3 surfaces, if you know they have the same Hodge structure, it's also strong enough to give you an automorphism of uh, uh, of a K3 surface starting from some linear algebra data. Um, so that, that gives you a way to, to produce lots of automorphisms of a K3 surface, sort of enough to, uh, to prove this theorem. Okay, but that's all I'll say about that because um, I want to get on to uh, my contribution to all this, which is um, just generalizing this statement to, uh, to pairs. So let me just, what can I say? So first of all, I should say by that Kalamata and um, I guess earlier, Morrison conjectured that um, this same statement should apply to Calabi Al varieties of any dimension. Um, so, same, let's say, Stirk's theorem should hold for um, Calabi Al varieties of any dimension. And this has been checked for various um, <coughs> classes of K3, of, of Calabi Al varieties in dimension um, three mostly, um, but you know, it's definitely not known for, uh, it's, it seems to be a, f a long way from being known even for Calabi Yau threefolds. Nonetheless, it, it seems to be true as far as anybody can, can tell. Um, yeah, so in higher dimensions, you don't have this neat connection with hyperbolic geometry, um, but nonetheless, the statement in this formulation still seems to be true. Okay, um, right. Well, what I could actually do is generalize this uh, statement uh, from varieties to pairs. Um, so let's see what I can show is the following. So, I mean, I would make a more general conjecture that this thing should hold for, uh, for pairs instead of just varieties. And to indicate what that means, let me say what I can actually show, which is to say, um, let x common delta be um, a Calabi Yau pair of dimension two. Uh, let's say, to be specific, a KLT Calabi-Yau pair of dimension two. 
so x has dimension 2. Um, so that is um, x uh, delta is a KLT pair. And uh, what else? Um, Kx plus delta is numerically 0 instead of Kx being numerically 0. Um, and delta is an effective uh, divisor. Yeah. So I, mean, I should have said these things in a different order. But delta is an effective divisor. x comma delta is a KLT pair. And this Calabi L means that instead of Kx being numerically 0, Kx plus delta is numerically 0. Um, then uh, you get exactly the same conclusion. Um, let's see. Yuck. I guess I will erase this. Um, So then, um, the automorphism group of x preserving this divisor, or the automorphism group of x, either way, they both act on the Neff cone of x um, with a rational polyhedral fundamental domain. Okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So in that sense, uh, I mean, the Calabi L pairs, in a sense, turn out to be a, a, a you know, perfectly well-behaved generalization of Calabi L varieties. Um, now, you might ask, what sort of uh, varieties are these? I mean, maybe more important than anything about the proof is, so what are examples of Calabi L pairs, uh, for example, in dimension 2? So there's, they include Calabi L surfaces just by taking delta equals 0. Um, I guess more generally, they include Calabi L surfaces with quotient singularities. Oh, I should make the point that, uh, yes. So um, a surface x, if you view it as a, a pair with a zero divisor, uh, is KLT if and only if it has the most quotient singularities. Um, so KLT is a very simple um, condition in dimension 2. OK, so for one thing, this applies to uh, to, to, so to speak, K3 services with quotient singularities, um, but it's also a bit more general than that. Um, OK. <coughs> what are some examples where this applies to? Well, let me just uh, sort of quickly think about what this condition means. Um, so if, hmm, how do I want to do this? Maybe I'll start. Uh, Sort of start by sketching the uh, proof enough to um, uh, enough to give some idea of what these surfaces are. So the proof goes by saying um, you can reduce to the case um, where x is just by passing from x to a, a sort of minimal resolution. You can reduce to the case where x is smooth um, and x delta is a KLT Calabi L pair. So you could. While keeping delta effective, you can, you can make x smooth and keep all the other hypotheses. So basically, yeah, you can assume that the surface x is nice. Well, you still have this condition. So how do you prove the theorem? Well, if delta equals 0, then uh, we're done by Stokes' theorem. Then x actually is a, a Calabi L surface, so roughly a K3 surface or an abelian surface. Um, otherwise, delta is not 0. Uh, so a way to rewrite this hypothesis is to say that minus kx is represented by this, is numerically represented by this effective divisor delta, which is not zero. And in that situation, <coughs> you can see that x is a special sort of surface. It has a negative Kodaira dimension. So um, the Kodaira dimension of x is obviously minus infinity. There's no way that the canonical bundle could be represented by an effective divisor. Um, so x is, so the theorem applies to basically surfaces that are rational or um, by rationally ruled. Um, and also, it applies to very, this hypothesis applies to very few ruled surfaces. So, I mean, there's a, a few, uh, a very few examples of that type, but let me just say that mostly um, x is rational. So, yeah, so this theorem is, is mostly 
apart from the case of Calabial varieties in the usual sense, it's mostly talking about rational services. Um, but I want to argue that that's not uh, sort of a boring class of services um, if you're studying these uh, NEF cones. Um, yeah, so we've already seen examples of by some effective divisor. Um, so, you know, sections of minus k can grow at a polynomial rate of 0, 1, or 2. Um, this is sort of the easy case. This is somewhat harder. This is the uh, hardest. So, um, if minus k is a talk of dimension 2, then um, there exists some other divisor that makes x uh, Fano. Um, so, the net cone is rational polyhedral, um, and we're done. Uh, let's see. You know, if the if the net cone is rational polyhedral, then this is always true. Also, in that case, you could say that the discrete part of the automorphism group of X is just a finite group. So, sort of, that's an easy case. Um, secondly, it might happen that minus k is equal to dimension one, um, and then minus k is going to give uh, a minus k or some multiple is going to give you uh, a uniquely defined elliptic vibration. Um, so, so some multiple of minus k gives um, an elliptic vibration over P1. Um, maybe not a minimal elliptic vibration, which makes life a little bit complicated, but nonetheless, this is a pretty uh, concrete situation. So here, the automorphism group of X is um, it's a finally generated abelian group, uh, and up to find an index, it's just the more del Vey group of this, the group of sections of this uh, over the vibration. Um, uh, and you know, you can analyze what all the uh, minus one curves on X are. They are basically multi sections of this vibration of a certain degree, and um, let's just say things are not so hard in this case. Um, but the the fun was supposed to be uh, this last case, um, which are somehow the where the minus k is, has uh, Itaka dimension zero. Those are sort of the the most uh, exotic among these rational services, the ones that um, are kind of least like Fano varieties. So <coughs> for um, rational services with Itaka dimension zero, um, the the theorem is definitely complicated in the sense that the automorphism group of X need not be uh, finite. It need not be finite by abelian. It can be um, a fairly general group acting on hyperbolic space. Um, that's a bit vague, but if you look at examples, uh, you can see that it, um, it's definitely not abelian or anything close to that. It can be, um, yeah, uh, you know, something like SL 2z at, at the very least, something as complicated as that. Um, right. So how do you, you know, prove this theorem anyway? This automorphism group is big and complicated. You're not really going to get your hands on it very explicitly. Um, so the trick here is, <coughs> um, so here, um, so delta will be a finite set of curves with negative intersection pairing negative definite intersection pairing. Um, and you can, so you can contract them all in this case. Uh, let me just do this. X comma delta maps onto some other surface Y where these divisor has just become points. And here, here you have minus K represented by this effective divisor. And here you have the surface where minus K has become zero. So this sort of surface is pretty roughly it's a K3 surface divided by a finite group. Um, and the, uh, the way the proof works in this, for this last class of rational surfaces is that you reduce to the case of K3 surfaces. <coughs> so um, you know how to produce uh, tons of automorphisms of K3 surfaces when, when they have any reason at all to exist. Um, you know, and that also applies to K3 surfaces my finite groups. So you know how to produce tons and tons of automorphisms of, of this sort of surface. Turns out to be enough to prove this theorem. So I'm late. I stop.